All righty, we can go ahead and get started. It is 1130. Thank you, Angela, for pressing record. Um, welcome, everyone, to improve your leafy crop quality with JEDAG and a BioUnite IPM program. I'm Brenda Palencia, a marketing intern at Marillion Bio Innovations, and we can go ahead and get started. Uh, before we continue, I would like to remind everyone about CEU credits. There will be a quiz at the end of the webinar where you can scan a QR code with a mobile device, or I will also add a link in the chat section. If you have any questions, you can feel free to ask myself. I would also like to remind you for Washington credits, you must participate in the comment section with your name, your license number, and accredited agency, as well as take the quiz at the end of the webinar. Also, we do have California Crop Advisor credits today, so make sure to scan the QR code that is up on the screen right now. That is just to sign in and you will get your credits as well as take the quiz at the end of the webinar. And if you have any questions, of course, feel free to ask myself and we can get started. Before we hand it over to Melissa and Taylor, I would like to remind you all that Marone Bio Innovations is a publicly traded company. So we are required to remind you that any information discussed in this presentation should not be solely used to determine your interest and or level of investment in its stock. We encourage you to conduct your own due diligence when making financial investment decisions about Marone Bio Innovations. Now we can introduce our speakers today. We have Dr. Melissa O'Neill. Dr. Melissa O'Neill has served in her current role with Marone Bio Innovations as a Senior Product Development Manager for the Southwestern United States since June of 2014. Prior to that time, she worked as a PCA and CPA with Booth Ranches and was formerly an employee of Dr. Beth Grafton Cardwell's Citrus Entomology Laboratory, jointly stationed at Lindcove Kearney Agricultural Research and Extension Centers. Melissa holds AA and AS degrees from College of the Sequoias, a BS in biology from Fresno State, and a AMS apologies, in agriculture from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and a doctorate of education from California State University, Fresno. Melissa's current research interests include entomology, plant pathology, plant health, and weed science. She is also involved with investigations centered on issues affecting women in science, technology, mathematics, and engineering, disciplines of the importance of STEM education to overall student success. We also have Taylor Hoover. Taylor is a Morel Bio Innovations Territory Sales Manager for the Central Coast of California. He covers from Ventura County to Alameda County. Taylor is a licensed pest control advisor and certified crop consultant. He has been involved in many aspects of organic strawberry inputs for almost 10 years. After his time with Acadian Sea Plants, a leader in seaweed extract, Taylor found his way to Morel Bio Innovations and has expanded his range of knowledge into many crops, including leafy greens. Taylor has found passion in providing organic solutions to growers of all crops along the coast. And now I will pass it over to Taylor, I believe. Thank you, Brenda, for that great introduction. Hello, everybody. I see a lot of familiar names. It's great to have you all on. Uh, we'll first discuss our agenda. So we're just going to quickly go over Marone Bio as a company and what's going on with us, um, what's been new. We have a few changes that have happened over the last year. Then we'll talk a little bit about what biologicals are and how they're classified and get into some of the biological uh, IPM solutions for leafy green diseases. So I'll introduce our fungicides and then Melissa will talk about the data for those uh, for those fungicides. And then we will get into the insecticides where I will introduce Marone Bio's bioinsecticides and Melissa will then discuss the data associated with those. At the end, hopefully we'll have enough time for Q&A. We will certainly make time for it, um, though we may be over our one hour allocated time. Go ahead. Thank you. 
So as a company overview, uh, the company was founded in 2006 by Dr. Pamela Marone. She has since stepped down as our CEO and our new CEO as of last year was, is Kevin Helash. We became a public company in 2013 and have recently changed our, our relocated our headquarters to Raleigh, North Carolina. It was formerly, we were formerly located in Davis, California. We still have that facility for research and development purposes, but for national sales, it makes more sense for us to be on the East Coast to uh, satisfy time, to time change differences. Our manufacturing plant is still in Bangor, Michigan. I'm proud to say that most of Marone Bio products are manufactured right here in the United States. And we are working on just, I believe, one or two more products to be manufactured right here as well. We have nationwide sales and technical support that is available to you at any time, as well as global distribution. We have over 450 worldwide patents here at Marone Bio and have discovered well over 18,000 different uh, different bacterias and fungi um, isolated at, in the lab, which shows our devotion to agricultural biosolutions. Next slide, please. So here's a map of the United States that outlines uh, our territories as sales reps. Uh, go ahead and take note as to your territory and your sales rep. We will be providing our contact information towards the end of the presentation, and you can always find our information online on our website or on LinkedIn. So here is our broad, uh, a broad picture of what our portfolio looks like here at Marone Bio. You're probably familiar with the majority of our crop protection products that are listed there on the left. We have a couple of new plant health products called uh, Haven and Pace, Pace Setter, as well as uh, expanding into seed treatments and foliar fertilizers in partnership with other companies, as well as um, acquisitions of other companies. Most of these products aren't available in California, so if you mind going to the next slide, we will just be focusing on these products here. So we have our fungicide and bactericide disinfectants, Jet Ag and Jet Oxide, as well as our fungicide, uh, bio, bio fungicides, I should say, Regalia and Sargus, and our insecticides, Venerate and Grandivo. We won't be talking about it in this presentation, but it is notable to uh, include Haven in this introduction of our portfolio. It is a, uh, a sun protectant product that is widely used in almonds and grapes. However, it is labeled for leafy greens as well. We just don't have a lot of experience at this moment with Haven and leafy greens, something that we're gonna be working on in the upcoming future. So to start off, I'd like to discuss the classification of biologicals. I think this is important because it's a commonly uh, misunderstood concept of what biologicals are and what the different classifications mean. So first we have biopesticides, which is basically what encompasses the majority of Marone Bio's products. These are crop protection products. Uh, these are typically bacillus or chromobacterium, bacterial species, um, in some cases can be fungal species as well. The next classification is a biostimulant, and this is these are crop enhancement products such as seaweed extracts, uh, humic and fulvic acids. These products essentially make uh, nutrition more available or more are used more efficiently in the plant to help stimulate the plant, not necessarily by providing any additional nutrition, but by providing support to the plant's uh, uh, growth system. The third and final classification of biologicals are biofertilizers. 
And these fall under the crop nutrition aspect of biologicals. And these aren't necessarily just organic fertilizers, but these are typically bacteria and fungi that would help to make these fertilizers more available in the soil. So some examples of those would be rhizobium or azotobacter, which are the bacteria that are associated with legumes in fixation of nitrogen. Next slide, please. So let's break down the classifications of, or the categories, excuse me, of biopesticides. The first category of a biopesticide is a microbial product. Microbial products are, well, just that. They are products that contain microorganisms and or their fermentation byproducts. These uh, are fungi, bacteria, viruses, or protozoas that are uh, made in the lab. Some examples of those products would be Stargus, Venerate, and Grandivo. The second category would be a biochemical. And a biochemical is any naturally occurring substance, so plant extract, pheromone, soap, or fatty acid. An example of this would be regalia, which is a plant extract of Renutria sachilinensis, which is the common name giant, uh, giant knotweed. And the third category is something that Marone has not dabbled in, but these are plant incorporated protectants. In other words, GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms. An example would be BT corn. And this involves the manipulation of the genome of the plant to allow a, uh, quote, naturally produced chemical within the plant um, that is helping to protect it from, in this case, Lepidopteran pests. Next, please. So before we get too deep into the weeds, I'd like to take a moment and discuss BioUnite. And BioUnite is a uh, term coined by, by Marone Bio. And the slogan here is harnessing the power of biology with the performance of chemistry. And the concept here is what I like to view as true sustainability. It's the idea of, uh, of combining conventional products in your IPM program with biological products. And this can be either in rotation or in tank mix in order to improve the efficacy of your IPM program. And there are several factors in which these are uh, in which this benefits. The first is that you'll get an improved level of control with your conventional program. By incorporating some of these biological pro uh, products, you'll see in some of our data sets that you can actually improve the level of control of your uh, of your applications. The second is that you're managing resistance. Resistance in both insect pests and diseases are a very important aspect of being a responsible pest control advisor. And using biological products can greatly reduce the uh, rate at which pests become resistant to synthetic chemistries. The third is that we're managing residues. All of Marone Bio products are MRL exempt, meaning that they do not have any maximum residue limit for the um, for post harvest application. Then we have an expanded range of targeted pests. So oftentimes in synthetic chemistries, you are limited to a very narrow list of pests and biological products, particularly Marone Bio products, have generally a very large, broad portfolio of pest control, um, of pests that they would control. So in using some of our biological products with the conventional, you can actually broaden the control of uh, the insects or diseases that you're targeting and get more than, um, you know, a little bit more out of the tank. The next you have getting more out of your active ingredients. So as I'm sure you well know, you can only use so much uh, synthetic chemistry. A lot of chemistries have limitations on how much per acre you can use in a, in a growing season or in an annual a calendar year. And by, tank mic by reducing the amount of active ingredient of the synthetic chemistries and adding a little bit of biological to that tank mix, you can actually expand 
uh, how how many sprays you're going to get throughout the season. Likewise, if you rotate with a full rate of the synthetic with some of the biological products we'll be talking about here, you can actually do the same thing by getting more uh, more sprays throughout the season and prolong the use of those synthetic chemistries. And then last but not least, you have an improved return on investment with uh, reducing synthetic, uh, the amount of synthetic chemicals you're purchasing, which can be very pricey, along with improved levels of control by utilizing the biological products, you can increase your return on investment as a farmer. Next slide, please. So real quick, uh, I just wanted to, here's some, just a table of general BioUnite recommendations that Marone Bio has some experience with. And keep in mind that our products can be blended, uh, tank mixed and rotated with several other chemistries as well as these, but these are the most, uh, these are the ones we have most experience with. So first we have Regalia with azoxystrobin, and this can be used to help control powdery mildew while still improving plant health from the Regalia. You have Stargus and Metalexyl, I think that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> uh, that is going to help control downy mildew, pythium, phytophthora, and a variety of other diseases as well. Grandivo plus a neonicotinoid such as acetamiprid uh, will help to better control aphids and whiteflies. And then of course, venerate plus uh, chemicals like intrepid, alticor, or also neonicotinoids can help improve control of mites, whiteflies, lepidopterans, and navel orangeworm. So I'd like to also mention, so I don't have to say it every single time we bring a product up, that all of our Marone, all of Marone Bio products, with the exception of Haven, are still MRL exempt, OMRI certified, require minimal PPE for the workers. They have a zero day pre-harvest interval, so they can be sprayed up to the day of harvest, and a four hour re-entry interval, meaning that four hours after an application, your workers can re-enter the field safely. Um, the 1500 plus trials uh, with our products is actually outdated. I think we're well over 2000 now. I know that I do um, on average just 20, 20 or so demos a year myself, and I know uh, R&D is putting out you know, anywhere from 25 to 100 trials every year with our, our products. So this is an ever increasing number. Next slide. So I'd like to first start by talking about our biofungicides. We'll be discussing our active ingredients, modes of action, the FRAC codes, best use practices, application methods, and then Melissa will be discussing the crop data. So first I'll talk about JEDAC. Go to the next slide. So what is JEDAG biofungicide? I'd first like to start by saying that JEDAG is, is most certainly the most powerful organic control option you have in your tool belt for control of fungal and bacterial diseases, as well as algae in, uh, in, in water treatment. And the reason that is, is because it, the active ingredient is a peroxyacetic acid. This is a non-selective, broad, broad spectrum uh, contact fungicide, bactericide, and algicide. It works through mode of oxidation, which essentially is drying out the cells of these uh, living organisms almost immediately upon contact. The application here can be used both soil and foliarly. So we can target both soil borne pathogens as well as foliar pathogens as well. There are some compatibility concerns such as uh, coppers and sulfurs. So you want to be careful you, not to mix JEDAG with any coppers or sulfurs in the tank. Also being careful not to apply JEDAG over the top of a copper or sulfur application. You wanna wait one to two weeks before making that application. You can't have uh, something for nothing in this world. 
So unfortunately, as powerful as JEDAG is, it does come with a danger label. So this is very important that your applicators are using all of the necessary PPE that is listed on the label as, as JEDAG can cause some serious bur uh, skin burns and eye, and eye damage as well. So being safe with JEDAG is very important. There is no known pathogen resistance to JEDAG because it is considered a sanitizer, which makes it a very powerful product for, long, for a long time to come. And it is OMRI listed, which is great. Next slide, please. So something that sets JEDAG apart from its competitors is that it is one product on one label, meaning that this product can be used for hard surface sanitation uh, agricultural water sanitation, irrigation line sanitation, as well as soil and uh, soil and foliar sanitation in uh, pre-harvest applications, pre and post-harvest applications. So unlike some of our competitors, we can we incorporate all of these benefits into one single label, making it a convenient option for PAA use. We're going to take a look real quickly at just some application rates for JEDAG. So when you're in the field or, in, or greenhouse and you have a high pressure situation of, say, let's use powdery mildew as an example, as that's a, a common problem in leafy greens. The curative rate, so if you've got a, a situation where the population or the pressure has gotten out of control, you want to go at a 1% solution. That's the equivalent of four quarts per 100 gallons or two quarts per 50 gallons as more as is more applicable to a leafy green application. The preventative rate here is an awesome way to get ahead of the curve, especially with mixing tank mixing with products like Regalia or Stargus. And you can essentially reduce the rate of JEDAG to a half a percent or two quarts per 100 gallon or one quart per 50 gallon in combination with regalia or stargus to help as preventative control for foliar diseases or soil diseases. The second way of applying JEDAG is through soil application or root drench in growing media in the greenhouse. And this application is typically a one to three gallon per acre application rate this is greatly dependent on the amount of flow, um, how much you dilute the JEDAG before injecting the system and the flow rate of your system. So always refer to, or it's recommended that you refer to the label. And if the math becomes a little bit too much, you can always reach out to a Marone bio rep and they would be happy to help you work that out. It's always beneficial to follow up with Stargus as a uh, additional soil inoculant when you're making an application of jet ag into the soil. And the reason is, is that you are essentially taking the whole entire community of uh, microorganisms in the soil and in the rhizosphere down a notch, and you want to replace those missing organisms with a beneficial. It's best to do this right away. The third way to use jet ag is irrigation or water treatment. And these are generally low rates. Again, you can refer to the label or a Marone bio rep who would be happy to help you figure out these rates. But essentially, it's a half ounce per gallon or an irrigation anywhere from four to 50 fluid ounces per 1,000 gallons. So you do need to know the flow rate of your system, which can be very helpful. Next, please. So we'll talk about Regalia first and then follow up with Stargus. I mentioned before that Regalia is a plant extract of Renutria sachilinensis, or a common name giant knotweed. Giant knotweed is a plant that is that wildly grows in northeastern Russia and Japan. So it's wild, uh, widely available in those regions. The application rate for regalia is anywhere from one to four quarts per acre, that lower rate being a more preventative or tank mix rate, and those uh, higher rates being somewhere in uh, the ballpark of curative rates. The frat code is a novel, uh, novel frat code because it has a novel mode of action of P5, 
and Regalia is the only product in that FRAP code. The application methods are both foliar and soil applications and has a signal word of caution, making it a worker-friendly worker product. Regalia is highly tank mix compatible with several products, most products, in fact. The only caveat is that you would it would be beneficial to be cautious of the amount of adjuvants that you're using in the tank with Regalia. Regalia does have its own adjuvant in it, so it's not necessary to add additional. But if you insist on using more adjuvants, we recommend the lowest uh, label rate of that adjuvant. Also, be considerate that other products you may be tank mixing may also have adjuvants in them as well. So I would avoid using too many products with included adjuvants as it may cause some staining from the regalia. You also want to avoid using uh, regalia at, a, at an excess of 1% volume to volume in the tank. And in most cases, this is not going to be a concern with ground applications, but it can be a concern with aerial applications as the water volume drastically reduces. So be cautious about that. Next slide, please. So here we'll discuss the modes of action of regalia, the novel modes of action of regalia. The first is that it inhibits pathogen growth through induced systemic resistance, or ISR. ISR is essentially a way to upregulate the plant's immune system. You can kind of imagine taking a probiotic as a human. It's going to help produce or help support our immune system. And this creates antimicrobial compounds within the plant, which are antagonistic to pathogen infestation. And the second is that it strengthens cell walls through the production of additional lignin. And when you get more lignin, you're thickening the cell wall, which is going to inhibit pathogen penetration. Along with inhib inhibition of pathogen penetration, you can get improved structural integrity. With more lignin, you're going to have stronger uh, stems and also stronger cuticle, as well as a firmer fruit coat if you're dealing with, say, a berry. The third mode of action here is that regalia promotes plant growth. And this is all, uh, just an added benefit to regalia. With all of the plant protection aspects, you're also going to enhance your plant health. And the reason regalia supports plant health is through the production of phytohormones and additional photosynthetically active chlorophyll. Anytime you have additional chlorophyll, you're improving photosynthesis, which is going to improve the overall vigor of your crop. And with a more vigorous crop, you have less, uh, less attraction of pests in general. Next slide, please. So here's a list of the target diseases of regalia. I've taken the time to highlight those that are most important in leafy green production. So we have things like powdery mildew, pythium, rhizoctonia, Xanthomonas, which is leaf spot, verticillium, fusarium, sclerotinia, and there are many, many more on the label that you can find. Best use practices for regalia, uh, as I mentioned, it can be used foliarly uh, through aerial application in the soil and also as a preplant dip. So in foliar application, we recommend a 100 to 200 gallons per acre. You can most certainly go less than that. Uh, you want to repeat your applications on a 7 to 10 day interval, and it's great to rotate with other IPM options as well. Aerial application is a half a quart to one quart per acre with a minimum 10 gallons per acre spray volume, minding that 1% solution I discussed earlier. Soil applications is one to four quarts per acre. I, however, recommend a stronger concentration of two to four quarts per acre. In my experience, we see better response from the plant when making soil applications at a half a gallon to one gallon application rate. This can be done in furrow, through soil drench, 
or chemigation in the drip. And you can repeat this application up to 14 day interval. Um, I say 14 to 30 day interval is uh, is fine. As a pre plant dip, it's a one to two quart rate uh, per 100 gallons, and this is going to improve uh, plant growth, uh, root establishment and suppress diseases in the soil. Next, please. The last fungicide we're going to discuss before Melissa discusses some of the data will be Stargus. Stargus is our newest biofungicide and it is our only living biofungicide. It's actually our only living product in general. It is a liquid product that is best used at a one to four quart per acre rate. It's considered to be a preventative fungicide like all or most other biological products are. The application can be used both in the soil and foliar leaves to help support uh, a healthy so soil microbiome and also help to prevent pathogen increase on the or pathogen penetration on the leaf surface. Frat code for Stargus is BMO2, which is a general bacillus frat code. Um, it falls in category with many of the other bacillus products available on the market today. The signal word here is caution, making it a very worker friendly product. And the best thing about Stargus compared to many other competitors is that it has no special storage requirements. It has an 18 month shelf life and can be stored in warehouses exceeding 100 degree Fahrenheit and also can be stored in freezing temperatures without any harm reduction of the product. It's also highly tank mix compatible. In fact, as powerful as JetAg is, Stargus can still withstand being in the tank with JetAg for up to two hours. So it is a very resilient strain of bacillus. Now the active ingredient here was formerly known as a bacillus amylilicophaceans, which is pretty common amongst other products on the market. However, we've recently found that it is a more novel strain of bacteria than or strain of bacillus than the amylilicophaceans and it has been reclassified as bacillus nakamari strain 727 which makes it a completely novel product to the market new on the label this year or i should say as of last year towards the end uh we now have approval for spraying botrytis on grapes and on berries it also has a label for chemigation in leafies, which is applicable here. And we've also added fusarium to that label as well. Next slide, please. We take a look at the three modes of action of Stargus. The first is that it has active molecules called lipopeptides that are produced naturally through the fermentation process of the product. Lipopeptides are just natural chemicals that are antimicrobial by nature. So um, essentially on contact, you'll have that antimicrobial factor right away. The second mode of action is that induced systemic resistance I mentioned earlier, but Stargus takes a step further and also has systemically acquired resistance. I mentioned ISR is the equivalent of taking a probiotic for a human, whereas SAR is an upregulation of the immune system in response to um, essentially an attack on the immune system. So tar Stargus is tricking the plant into believing it's being infe infected and it's going to naturally upregulate its own immune system to protect itself even further. The last, the last mode of action for Stargus is arguably the most important. And this is that it forms a protective shield either around the roots or the or the leaves, depending on where the product is applied. This protective this protective shield is a living uh, a, li a living bacteria that is colonizing on the surface of the roots or, or leaves and is going to help uh, provide protection from pathogens to uh, in penetrate into the plant. And as you can see, there's a picture right there of the spores germinating in a Petri dish. This is essentially what's occurring on the leaf or root surface. So I take 
I'd like to take a second to discuss why it would be beneficial to use both Regalia and Stargus in rotation. You'll notice that on the label of both Regalia and Stargus, there's a lot of overlapping diseases um, that both will treat for. So the big common question is, when do I use one or the other, or why would I try to use both if one's gonna take care of the same disease? Well, the answer is a little complex, but I'll walk you through it. The first is that there's two different modes of action between Regalia and Stargus. Regalia is somewhat of a systemic response where the plant is protecting itself from the inside out. Whereas Regalia, or excuse me, whereas Stargus is providing that protective shield as well as those lipopeptides on the exterior portion of the plant, handling the diseases on the outside. So if we take a look at Regalia, the, we found it to be most effective against powdery mildew, bacterial spot, alternaria, and anthracnose, whereas Stargus is most effective against downy mildew, botrytis, or blight. So in, to, re, to summarize, you can essentially prime your crop from the inside out with Regalia while maintaining uh, crop health benefits such as promotion of plant growth and increase of yield. Where, and you can all, with Stargus, you can also protect your crop from the outside with that living protective shield we discussed earlier. The great thing is, is that both these products are a great addition to the IPM program, uh, to any IPM program, because both products are highly tank mix compatible. They can be included with insecticide applications, foliar applications, as well as other fungicide applications in tank mix. Next slide. Uh, I think at this point, we're gonna be passing it on to Melissa. So Dr. O'Neill, please do your thing with the data. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Can you hear me clearly? We can. Excellent. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here today and I have the pleasure of sharing some of the fungicide data with you for which Taylor has just given us excellent background information on for products. The first data set will be downy mildew on lettuce and this was a study conducted in Yuma, Arizona. A little bit of housekeeping here. Typically, you'll see a treatment timing table. In this particular slide, it's in the upper right-hand corner. I'd like to kind of go over that so we know what we're looking at. There are some letters A through D there and some corresponding dates listed underneath within that treatment timing table. Those letters correspond to the letters that are along the X axis there. So taking, for example, the far left hand sidebar, which is double nickel two pounds per acre A through D. That means that A through D are the application timings A, B, C, and D and correspond to the 20th of February all the way through the 16th of March in 2020. And that will go for most of our slides. You'll be seeing that sort of a treatment timing table and it will refer back to those letters along the X axis. So with that said, for this present data set, we'll be considering the percentage incidence due to downy mildew on lettuce for our y-axis. In this study, double nickel as a standard, two pounds per acre at all four treatment timings, as well as Sonata as a standard, two quarts per acre at all four treatment timings. Both of those had a bit higher incidence when we consider the data set overall. But shifting your eye to the right hand side of the slide, we'll look at our MBI products and um, kind of had the headers running together. I'm sorry about that. But the first blue bar that's more towards the center is Stargus, two quarts per acre applied at all four treatment timings, brought that incidence down to about half of what was seen in double nickel and far below what was observed for Sonata. So that standalone Stargus treatment. And then moving to the right hand most blue bar, that is Stargus, two quarts per acre added to to in a tank mix with JEDAG 19.2 fluid ounces per acre at all four treatment timings. And that particular treatment on the far right had the lowest overall percentage incidence, both very good options for management of downy mildew on lettuce. Moving into our next slide, we'll continue to discuss about some of these data. And again, with downy mildew, we have quite a body of data on that pathogen as it is very important. Treatment timing table upper right, as you can see, there were four treatments from the 19th of September of 2019 all the way through the 10th of uh, October of the same year. 
Percentage severity is what we're considering on our Y axis, and you'll see that there is a legend at the bottom of the slide running all the way along the bottom three different colors, and those represent our treatments. The brown is double nickel two pounds per acre applied at four treatment timings. So NADA is in the gray, three quarts per acre being the rate, same timings. And then Stargus is in the purple, purple or blue, depending on your screen, two quart per acre rate, all four treatment timings. The first clustering of bars, which is more on the left hand side of the screen, is from the 9th of October sampling date. And we see a trend here with double nickel in the brown bar being a bit higher. Um, Sonata bringing down that pressure of severity to 17.8, but Stargus in the blue being lowest of all at 14% severity. If we look about a week later on the 17th of October sampling bars, which are on the right hand side of your screen, we can see a little bit of difference within the standards, meaning that um, at that sampling date, the double nickel was lower, 19.2, the Sonata at 20.5, but Stargus still kept pressure down compared to the other two at 16.8. And I see there's a question in the chat um, Taylor can address some of those, and if not possible, I will get back to those after I present these fungicide data and as he transitions into the insecticide data. But for now, uh, that covers that slide, so we'll move on, please. And we'll talk about downy mildew still, but we'll shift gears in that we're considering spinach as a crop in this instance. Treatment timing table upper right, we can see there are three treatments in this study from New Year's Day of 2021 to the 23rd of February, a little bit more spread out in those treatments. And these were conducted with Dr. Pudel Ward out at U University of Arizona. Mean percentage infection on the y-axis and it being a university trial, you can see we've run the gamut of standards within this, uh, which is very good for comparison. Untreated control, the brown bar all the way on the left being up near 30% infection, so some moderate pressure there. Going across with the standards, they're all in gray here on this bar, and um, we have Actigard one ounce per acre applied at the three treatment timings, Torac 21 ounces per acre, same timings, Rango 1.8% volume to volume at the three treatment timings. Those kind of being in a downward spiral of reducing the um, percentage in infection, all three better than the untreated control, but Stargus being slightly lower than those already mentioned, and that Stargus program here is in the blue bar, sort of in the middle of the screen, two quarts per acre, Stargus plus JetAg, 60 64 fluid ounces per acre, 100 gallons, A through C, excuse me. Um, that treatment there, and we consider some of these heavy hitter standards like Revis and Reason applied at the three treatment timings. They were slightly lower than Stargus, but still significantly similar. So we'll move on from there. And we'll talk about a little bit more lettuce and downy mildew. Another study here with re research design for agriculture, excuse me, um, for treatment timings there from the 7th of January 2020 through the 14th of February of the same year. Percentage incidence on the Y axis. And as you can see in the untreated control, very high between 85 and 90 percent. So, um, Ritimal Gold was the standard in this particular study. The SL formulation, four fluid ounces per acre, applied at all four treatment timings. Reduce that pressure to between 65 and 70 percent. Well, the Stargus treatments over on the right, it's BioUnite, which is adding our biologicals with chemistry, as Taylor mentioned before two quarts per acre of Stargus added to three fluid ounces per acre of Ritimal Gold SL. And as you might notice, that's a reduced rate from what the Ritimal Gold standard standalone was because that's four fluid ounces in the standalone. And we saw a great reduction with that, adding our chemistry and biologicals together down near 55%, which isn't bad in a super high pressure um, situation such as this one. Moving from there, we will talk about um, downy mildew BioUnite programs a bit further. Another study with research designed for agriculture out in Yuma, where the treatment timing table is a little more over to the left this time. But as you can see, it ranged from the 7th of January to the 14th of February during 2020. 
pounds per acre on the y-axis. So the very important yield metric being considered with these data, untreated control in the brown bar on the left, around 18,000 pounds, a little below. Ritamol gold, 0.25 pints per acre A through D, was slightly higher in about a little over 18,000 pounds per acre of lettuce. Um, midway head lettuce, I should mention, was the varietal. With our BioUnite program, which is on the far right, we had the Stargus two quarts per acre added to the three fluid ounces per acre A through D of Ritamol Gold. And that ended up being a 24 to 1 return on investment or ROI based on the ROI assumptions that are in the upper left hand corner of the slide, which was approximately $1,700 additional revenue based on the market conditions at that time. So some good results there showing not only reducing the pathogenicity load Load, but as well increasing yield with Stargus. Next slide. We'll talk about new film P or surfactants. With spinach, which is a very touchy crop when it comes to phytotoxicity showing up, phytotoxicity uh, for those that might not be familiar is the potential for our agricultural products to induce damage on our crops. So uh, Stargus was added to new film P in a study run by the University of Arizona. Actually, John Palumbo was responsible for this study. Those weren't the only treatments in the study, but um, just including some photos here because they're worth a thousand words instead of a big old fat graph or data slide. Um, Stargus two quarts per acre plus new film P four ounces per acre is in your left hand most picture. And you can see those spinach leaves look very fair without any phytotoxicity noticeable. On the right hand side is the water control. So it was water added to new film P four ounces per acre. Same look, and that's what we like. We won't want any phyto shown with our Stargus. Um, so that was a safe combination and good news there. Next slide. We'll talk about spinach a little bit further with downy mildew here in King City, California, up near Salinas on the Avenger variety. Four treatment timings from the 14th of October through Halloween of 2019 percentage severity on the y-axis in our treatments along the x-axis as we'll notice we'll first focus our eye over on the left which is two bars for double nickel two pounds per acre all four treatment timings those headings um the first bar which is all the way on your left is data from 11 5 2019 and then towards the right hand bar on that same cluster above double nickel will be the data from the seventh couple days later. So we're looking at severity as the crop progresses. A couple days later with double nickel, we saw a little boost in that severity. It went up from about 23 to 27% for those particular treatments on the respective dates. Moving towards the middle, we see serenade ASO two quarts per acre at the four treatment timings. Again, 11.5 being the date for the left hand bar and 11.7 being the date for the right hand bar of the middlemost cluster for serenade. Kind of constant disease pressure about 17 or 15% across both sampling dates. Stargus two quarts per acre for the four treatment timings is all the way on the right in the blue. And for the both the sampling dates, it had the lowest percentage severity in Stargus. It was lower um, than serenade definitely on the first and a hair lower than serenade on the second being 11.7 and far below what was observed for double nickel on both sampling dates. Next slide. And um, did we move slides here? Yeah, we're looking at percent incidence. And incidence OK, I apologize. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Taylor. My eye got uh, distracted by a chat. So now since we talked about percentage severity a moment ago, as Taylor kindly pointed out, we'll talk about percentage incidence from the same study, that Avenger variety of spinach. No need to go over the treatment timings because they're the same. So we'll just consider the percentage incidence scale on the Y axis. As before, we have our same treatments in the same layout in that the left hand most bar of each cluster is the data from the 5th and then the right is the 7th of November. Double nickel having between 35 and close to 50 percent severity over that two day span. 
Serenade ASO in the middle to quarts per acre being slightly lower. We can see that on the first sampling date of the 5th of November it was about 25% incidence. And then um, on that second bar, it shot up to near 40% incidence. So you can see things change within a couple of days under the right conditions. Stargus two quarts per acre A through D, those two blue bars on your very right hand side had the lowest percentage incidence overall being just just a hair above 20 on the first sampling date and about 18 on the second sampling date, which it's good to see that reduction, especially on that second sampling date when our other two standards actually went up during that time frame. So Sargus being a good option for downy mildew and spinach, and as you saw before, not potential for phytotoxicity. Moving. To our next slide, we'll talk about powdery mildew and lettuce. A little bit different. We've been on downy for a while now, so this is a good change it up. Uh, Dr. Pudel Ward again on the Magosa variety of lettuce. Important to see the treatment timing table here. Three treatments, the 3rd of February through the 2nd of March of 2021. And there's a rating scale that is involved in this slide, and it's kind of complex. I'll leave that to you to look through it detail and these slides will be posted on our website later if you want to review but zero rating meaning no mildew present and five meaning heavy mildew present on the entire plant we can see our top uh, rating here on our y-axis is about 2.6 so it's present on bottom leaves and lower wrapper leaves and in between that and present on the bottom leaves and all of the wrapper leaves so that's kind of what we're seeing in the untreated control which is the brown bar all the way on the left so moderate pressure there. A bio unite treatment being our middle bar regalia two quarts per acre added to 12 ounces of quadrus at the three treatment timings, bringing that down that uh, disease rating to a respectable 1.6. Razox is a new pro, uh, product that we will be having in California at some point, although it'll be on the East Coast. It is a Maroon Bio product. It includes Renutria sicolinensis, which is the active in Regalia giant knotweed, along with Azoxystrobin. So we tested that out here, and that uh, sufficed to bring down pressure uh, to a disease rating of about 1.6, which both of which were far under what was observed for untreated control. So we'll go to our next slide. <clears throat> we'll talk about downy mildew on midway lettuce with research designed for agriculture for treatment timings up there. The percentage in incidence on the y-axis with the untreated control getting up there near about 60%. Quadrus 15.5 ounces per acre at the four treatment timings, bringing that down to about 15%, respectable activity there. But we had a BioUnite program, which is on the far right, and although you don't see a bar there, there were data. There was 0% incidence in the treatment that included regalia two quarts per acre, added to that reduced rate at the 13.75 ounces per acre of quadrus applied at the four treatment timings. If you consider quadrus as a standard by itself in the middle gray bar, you can see that that was a little bit higher of a rate at the 15.5 ounces compared to what was added in that BioUnite tank mix. Next slide. Talking about that head lettuce a little bit further and once again, including some yield metrics since they're very important. These are the same um, group of treatments as we saw in the prior slide, but we're looking at yield in pounds per acre on the Y axis where our untreated control, which is the brown bar on the right, had about 19,250 19, pounds per acre. Quadrus at standalone 15.5 ounces per acre had a little above 20,500. But here, Regalia and Quadrus, that uh, BioUnite treatment was a little below 21,000, coming out at an eight to one return on investment. We'll move to our further slides and um, talk about fusarium and lettuce after which we'll switch off to our bioinsecticide portfolio. So Regalia and JEDAG were applied only one treatment timing and that happened to be the 25th of September in the soil at planting. And Dr. Pudel Ward doing these um, research plots, the mean percentage infection due to fusarium on the y-axis. Untreated control uh, around 18% 
Rhyme 1.6 quarts per acre and Howler 5 pounds per acre were a couple of the standards in this study which didn't control the fusarium in this case very well. In fact, they both went up above what was observed in the untreated control as you might notice. Our program was Regalia 2 quarts per acre plus JEDAG 64 fluid ounces per 100 gallons at that A timing, and that brought down um, the fusarium a couple points below what was observed in the untreated. As you can see, it was a tough, tough pathogen to control compared to um, many others, and as you might notice with some of those other standards, struggling to control it in this case. So I think, Brenda, we'll go to our next slide, but it may be time to turn it back over to my colleague, uh, Taylor, and I'll let you go ahead, Taylor. Thank you, Melissa, for those great data sets. I realize that we are uh, approaching our time limit here, so I'll try to speed up as much as I can, but there are some important uh, information in here, so try to bear with us. We'll discuss our bioinsecticide uh, portfolio next. So we're talking about Grandivo, WDG, and Venerate in this section. Next slide. The first product we're going to talk about is Grandivo WDG. Grandivo is a dry product. It's a wettable, dissolvable granule. And the active ingredient there is a Chromobacterium subsidiae. This product is a non-viable bacteria, meaning that it's been heat killed. So there's no concerns about killing the product with other, pro uh, with other conventional or organic products and you won't harm it by tank mixing it. So it is a tank mix compatible product as well. The application rate for Grandivo is between one and three pounds per acre. The IRAC code is a UNB, which is a bacterial agent or non-BT bacterial agent with unknown or uncertain mode of action. And I just would like to point out that it's very common for biologicals to have unknown or uncertain mode of actions at this time in uh, our knowledge of bio uh, biologicals and just how they respond to their environments and other, uh, other bacteria, diseases. The application methods for Grandivo is majority foliar. It does have a soil label for some circumstances, but in most cases, if you're trying to control soil borne pests with uh, insect pests, I would recommend Venerate, which we'll discuss later. Grandivo is a very safe product, having the signal word of caution, making it worker, uh, worker friendly. And it's very safe on beneficial insects because it's a uh, consumed product by the insect. Next slide. Taking a look at the Grandivo modes of action, uh, the first is agitation and repellency. And this is one of the uh, best parts about Grandivo is its repellency factor. So Grandivo tends to coat the leaf and create a layer that makes it unfavorable for insects to crawl on, making it an effective and uh, repellent for in particular mobile insects, such as let's say, uh, a cucumber beetle or a leafhopper or um, something along those lines. Agitation, so would be uh, more applicable to the non-mobile insects such as spider mites or aphids. It's going to cause them to move around the leaf a little bit more and stop their feeding uh, immediately. So Grandivo is an ingested product, so eventually those insects will take a bite and essentially is going to cause a gut disruption uh, and cause the insect to die from the inside out. Please keep in mind that Grandivo does have a kind of slow kill process to it of, you know, four to seven days or so. But what the best part about Grandivo is, is it's kind of, I like to picture it as a numbers game. It reduces the egg laying and egg hatching and fecundity of the insect. So what this means is when an adult does ingest Grandivo and it goes to lay its eggs, it's gonna have a much smaller follow-up generation, which is gonna reduce the number of pests in the future generation. This is gonna make future applications of other IPM products such as Venerate even more effective. This product is effective against uh, insects such as uh, mites, lepidopterans, thrips, aphids, uh, whitefly, 
all important pests in, in leafy green production. Next slide, please. Taking a look at that photo on the right, there is a, an example of the leaky gut syndrome that I was uh, discussing earlier. Uh, that is a yellow margin leaf beetle that has stopped feeding and is essentially leaking out from the inside and dying. Taking a look at the best use practices for Grandivo WDG, you want to make your first application at the first sign of pests. It's not a very effective product once the pest populations have gotten out of control. Grandivo does have a very long residual as it's very strong, has strong UV um, resistance. So it is active for seven to 10 days out on the leaf surface. But with that being said, I would not make an application prior to a rain or overhead irrigation event as Grandivo tends to be a very water soluble product and will easily wash off of the leaf in in those circumstances in which it would not be effective anymore. Recommended tank mix uh, for all of our products is between five and set a pH of five and seven. And you always want to use this product with a good surfactant or an oil to make sure that it's attaching to the leaf surface and spreading evenly across the leaf surface. Coverage is essential with Grandivo as it is a product that needs to be consumed by the insect. The insect will find areas of the leaf that does not have Grand Devo if you miss it. The recommended gallon per acre is very important for Grand Devo as in excessive amounts of uh, volume per acre, you can kind of wash the product out. And if you're spraying to run off, you're, you're wasting the product as it's running off the leaf. So if it's if it's too overly diluted, you're going to see a reduction in efficacy in my experience. So you want to avoid spray volumes that are too uh, too high. In leafy greens, that's not something that we commonly see. It's mostly strawberries and grapes and and other perennial crops. A great thing about Grandivo is there's no maximum number of applications per season. So you can if you do happen to put a application out right before it rains, uh, you could follow up directly after that rain and still get control. Next slide. We'll take a look at Venerate XC. Venerate is a, uh, another bioinsecticide. It's also a heat killed product and it overlaps a lot of the same insects that Grandivo does. And it always leads to the question, why do we have two different insecticides that control the same pests? The answer is again in differing active ingredients and differing modes of action. So the active ingredient for Venerate is Bocalderia rhinogensis. It is a non-viable bacteria as well. So there's also no concern about killing this product with other tank mixable products. The application rate for Venerate is two to four quarts per acre, although you can utilize Venerate as kind of a kicker in the pro, uh, in the tank with conventional products at a one quart per acre rate to improve the efficacy of your conventional programs. The Venerate also has an IRAC code of UNB, same as Grandivo, and it can be applied both in the soil and foliarly with a signal word of caution, making it a worker friendly product as well. Taking a look at the modes of action and benefits of Venerate, the first is ingestion. When an insect or mite does uh, feed on this product, they are subject to die in a period of four to seven days. So don't expect immediate death like you would with a synthetic chemical. There's a feeding interference factor that interferes with the probing behavior of piercing and sucking insects, and it stops feeding rapidly in the chewing insects. And there's a superior residual control as well uh, compared to BT insecticides because of its strong UV resistance. Venerate's also very safe on beneficials, just as Grandivo is. There has been rumors that Venerate does kill beneficial insects, but this has been disproven through uh, vigorous R&D work. And this allows for the beneficial insects to do what they're supposed to do in the field. So it's an, it's an additional benefit to using biological products. 
The best use practices for Venerate are very similar to Grand Devo. You want to make that application at the first sign of pests rather than later. Alternating grant, uh, Venerate with another chemistry such as Grand Devo on a seven to 10 day interval to change up the, uh, the mode of action and active ingredient is recommended. 50 to 100 gallons per acre water volume is the recommendation for Venerate, although you do have a little bit more flexibility with higher volumes of water in Venerate. You want to also avoid volumes that are ex uh, causing excessive runoff on the on the crop and use a good surfactant to make sure that the Venerate is going to have a nice long residual on the crop. Tank mix or the tank pH recommendation is also five to seven and also does not have any maximum number of applications per season. Next slide, please. Melissa, I'll hand it over to you for a couple of short data sets and then we will conclude our webinar. Thank you so much, Taylor. So we will talk a little bit about Liriomyza leaf miner, which is a dipterin or fly leaf miner in lettuce. This is on a two double E based on some research done out of Guadalupe, California with Apex Ag Research. Treatment timing table on the upper right again, treatments were four all the way from the 1st of August to the 21st of August in 2019. The number of mines per 10 lettuce leaves on the y-axis there with the untreated control in the brown bar on the left being above 90%, so heavy pressure due to Liriomyza in this case. Standard being a sale, one fluid ounces per acre at the A and C timings, followed by Movento, four fluid ounces at the B and D timings. Pressure there being around 50%, 50 mines per 10 leaves, excuse me. And Grandivo, one pound per acre, applied all four treatment timings, was slightly below that pretty heavy hitter standard, coming in at about 40 mines per 10 leaves under a very heavy infestation. Next slide. We're talking about aphids here on broccoli in the desert with research designed for agriculture. On the y-axis, the average number of aphids per leaf and with untreated control having between 12 and 13 aphids, as you can see with that high brown bar on the left. As a direct, came out at 48 ounces per acre at A through G timing. So there are multiple timings in this study about 11 aphids per leaf there, a bit lower than the untreated, but still tough to control some of these aphid pests in broccoli. Our Bio Unite program was venerated at two quarts per acre, added to as a direct uh, 48 ounces per acre at those same timings, and it brought down pressure by a little more than half compared to that standard applied alone, around nine aphids uh, per leaf there with our treatments in that broccoli. Moving on, might be, uh, yes, Western flower thrips, an important pest. There was a question earlier in the chat about Western or about thrips in general. I'm not sure if it was Western flower or another species, but really important to target nymphal thrips that are newly hatched when using biologicals. Treatment timing table in the upper right, March 10th, 21 through the 25th of March, 21, three treatments. Total number of thrips per plot on the Y axis with Dr. Palumbo, by the way, out in Yuma on this, 16 thrips per plot in the untreated control brown bar the middle is a standard radiant six ounces per acre was applied at all three treatment timings it's a little hard to see but that is around 10 thrips per plot total and with our bio unite treatment in the red bar including venerate one quart per acre added to that same six ounces per acre rate of the radiant applied at the three treatment timings showed a 50 percent reduction in thrips compared to the untreated control it was around eight thrips per plot for our bio unite program lower than what we observed for that standard applied alone. Next slide. And that is all for me and I thank you very much for your time. I'll check the chat to see if I've missed any questions. Taylor. Uh, if you could go back to that slide, Brenda, I want to take a second here. Thank you, Melissa, for that. I appreciate it. Um, I'd like to just take a minute to uh, discuss supply concerns uh, with Marone Bio and, and just supply concerns in the market space in general. So as I'm sure you are aware at this point, uh, many companies, many products have either been uh, put on hold for manufacturing uh, or are logistically difficult to get a hold of or on allocation. 
These are not the cases with our products at Marone Bio. I'm happy to say that, excuse me, my dog is exploding back there. Um, I'm happy to say that Marone Bio does have uh, or is produced in the United States. So it gives us a lot more availability to our of our products and we don't have any shortages at this time. Likewise, a lot of price increases have occurred. Marone Bio has seen some slight price increases, but we've kept it to a minimal range of about three to five percent, as opposed to many other products that have seen 20 to 20 plus percent increase in price. So we are doing our best to keep prices low to growers, as that's important to us, as well as keep product available, which is just a duty that we should all be considering um, in this type of market. So I just wanted to take a minute with that and we can go on to the next slide, which is a map of the reps in North America. Go ahead and note the rep that's in your area. All this information can also be found on Marone Bio's website, maronebio.com. And the next slide is all of our technical support reps, uh, including Dr. Melissa O'Neill, who spoke today. She's actually located here on the coast of California as well and is always available to answer questions. We also have uh, Marina up in the PNW and Brian in the Midwest, and then our big dog VP of field development and tech support, Dr. Tim Johnson, who's been with the company for many, many years and is the expert to ask. So with that, I think that about concludes our webinar. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. Um, always feel free to email us with any sorts of questions or comments on the webinars. We're always looking for new information on what we could be talking about, what we could do better. I think we've improved a lot over the last two years and we'd love to continue improving. So thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Taylor and Melissa, so much for joining us today. Um, if you're still here and you would like to take a quiz for CEU credits, you can feel free to scan the code that is up on the screen. You can also click on the link that I am about to paste into the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to contact any of us, and thank you for joining us today. We will stick around for a few minutes if you have any additional questions, but once again, thank you for joining us. So now we know there's about 35 people with this webinar just playing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or they're taking the quiz and they just signed up yet. Oh, test. yeah, I guess that's true. Mm.
Go Kelson. There's a question about when the test is due, and I believe we hope for people to take it right away after this webinar. As soon as you can, please. Yes, as soon as you can, and um, I will be sending out certificates within one week from today. So as soon as you can, that would be great. <laughs> They're taking the quiz. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Melissa, do you want to take that question as far as uh, time considerations of spraying venerate? Obviously, earlier the better, yeah. but. Sure, um, yes, uh, venerate should be applied at first incidence of pest pressure, preferably when newly hatched nymphs or larvae or whatever stage, if you have complete or incomplete metamorphosis in your pest, uh, emerges. And so that can be really important because thresholds differ for conventional chemistries. They're very low for biologicals. It's going to take careful scouting and monitoring of your crop to determine when you first start seeing pests and when they're at their earliest stages, because that's the timing when you apply venerate. Typical reapplication intervals for venerate are seven to 10 days. It can be shortened to five days in certain cases if need be, but uh, if you're scouting, as I mentioned, and treating, as I mentioned, seven to 10 day intervals should work fine. Thank you. I would like to mention that if anyone has issues with heat stress on their uh, leafy green crops, reach out to me. Uh, I'm looking to do some demos in leafy greens with our Haven product. So uh, it's something that we'd be playing around with, but I'd be happy to provide a little demo material to learn for ourselves as well. And if anyone's still listening, we'll be at the biocontrols conference in Monterey. We will have a booth there, so you can always come up and talk with us in person. We'd love to see you come by the booth, grab a hat. Hopefully we'll have hats by then. COVID's been rough. <laughs>
you. We have a question in the chat. Um, do you know if we have some data on stink bug control using Venerate? Oh, I wish Melissa was here. I think we might have some data on brown marmalated stink bug in almonds. Um, I will double check. If you wouldn't mind, send me an email. There's my email address. Um, send me an email and I'll get back to you with any data that we might have. I'm pretty sure we have it somewhere. It's just not a pest that's real common on the coast here. Thank you, Taylor. Box elder bug. I can't. I've never even heard of that one. I'm not sure even what kind of insect that is. But um, again, send me an email about it and I'll reach out to product development and see if we have any experience with it. I'll also reach out to our sales team. Um, sometimes they have anecdotal experience um, on certain pests that may not have data on it. I think it's pretty common in the Midwest, so. Yeah, yeah. Usually if I haven't heard of it, it's it's a Midwest pest. <laughs> <laughs> special, special pest. Then. Um, do you guys want, oh, okay, Brenda's on it. Yeah, I wish, I wish SurveyMonkey gave like a confirmation. It's so annoying. Um, Brenda will contact you directly, Cecilia, if, if we don't have it. Also, keep in mind that these are self-reported DPR hours. Sometimes we get confusion with that. Um, we're not, CAPCA is the only affiliation that will report your hours for you. So we will provide a, a certification of completion that you have to submit to DPR yourself in order to get the hours um, for it. So just, uh, just a heads up, that's a common confusion. OK, bye, Cecilia. Thank you. Brenda and Taylor, I see there's just nine people left on and 
I think we're pretty much covered, so I'm happy to hang on for a couple more minutes just in case anybody has a question. Otherwise, you guys are free to carry on with your day if you'd like. Great webinar. Thanks for all your help. Thanks, Angela. Appreciate it. Thanks for putting everything together. You bet. We're and Brenda. Yeah, of course. <laughs> definitely you, a team. Julie. Definitely a team effort. OK, you guys have an awesome rest of your day. I'll be in touch via email and I'll just I'll just sit on here um, and make sure nobody else has any questions. OK, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Angela.